about what happened that day on the cross. Help us to be present in this community in a way that we become a beacon of light and a beacon of hope, a beacon of reconciliation, a beacon of the good news of Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. Father, we long to be with you. We long to follow you. But we get so distracted. So help us in these 40 days to keep our eyes focused on you and to follow you in everything that we do. We thank you for this beautiful church and this church family and this community in which we live. We pray that you would pour out upon us all the healing that is needed, all the comfort that is lacking, all the direction that is sought. And Father, we pray that you would act through us and act through others to be a healing presence. Because we know that there are things that have gone unspoken in this room, concerns and needs we have that we can't bring ourselves to even write down on a piece of paper. So we pray that you would come into our secret places and heal us and help us. We thank you for those in our community who serve as first responders, who serve as government leaders, as school leaders. We thank you for the leadership of our church. And we pray that you would put your agenda on all of these people, that they would be godly leaders. We pray for our nation's leaders, for our world leaders, that there might be peace on earth as your son came to bring. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us, and we thank you that you have prepared a table before us. And so as we approach it, let each one of us be honest and humble and forthright about the ways that we have broken covenant with you. And may we all experience the blessing and the newness of forgiveness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our scripture for this morning comes from the book of Genesis. I'm going to read chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, and then chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves." This is the word of God for us, the people of God. So this morning marks the first Sunday in Lent. This past Wednesday, with our Ash Wednesday service, we kicked off the Lenten season and uh, we told the truth to God and to one another. You know, Ash Wednesday is, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. The thesis of of Ash Wednesday is, you're a sinner and you're going to (laughs) die. But the good news is that we belong to a God that forgives our sin and offers life and life eternal. But there's something almost relieving about that confession of of we're sinners, that we're frail. We live in in mortal bodies. And so that kicked off our season of Lent. And Lent is a season in the church calendar year uh, that is a preparatory season. There's this you know, rhythm to the church calendar year where it goes from preparation to celebration. Just as Advent is a preparation, a preparatory season for the celebration that comes at Christmas, Lent is a season of, of preparation as we prepare our heart, soul, and mind for the celebration to come at Easter as we celebrate the resurrection. So Lent is a season that we set apart 
to examine our lives. We attempt to pay attention to mind, body, and soul and God's will for our life. And, And what are the places in our life where perhaps we're falling short of God's will for our lives? You know, this past week I did, in between Ash Wednesday and uh, this Sunday, I did a good amount of reading about sin. I was like, let's get into some sin business this week, right? Did, did a lot of, of reading about sin, and I was reminded again of the sort of one God religions. With, with Islam and Judaism, there's these rules, these regulations that if you follow, you can be a pretty good guy or gal. There's some purification codes, there's some ways to get clean, and, and you can be a, a pretty good guy or gal. And, and I was reminded that, that Christianity makes it almost near impossible for us to remain sinless. Like with all the good news that comes in the New Testament, there's a lot, a lot, the whole thing is good news. But I was reminded again that for all the good news that comes, Jesus also makes the system pretty hard. And before, as I'm flipping through those Ten Commandments, I'm like, I'm doing pretty good, right? Check. Got that, not stealing, not killing. I'm, I'm pretty good on, on the Ten Commandments. But Jesus comes along and says, even if you think about it, you've sinned in your heart. Even if you've considered it. Right? Jesus brings like intent into the equation. We talked on Wednesday how you know, even when we're doing the right things, even when we're praying, even when we're fasting, even when we're giving alms, if we're not doing it with the right intent, then we're in sin. Right? If, if we're doing it with an intent to glorify ourselves rather than God, then that too has missed the mark. And I was reminded of, of how badly each and every one of us falls short of the glory of God. There's not, not a one of us that could earn it on our own by keeping the rules and regulations. And as I was reading about sin, my favorite um, definition that I, I've come across of sin is humanity's right, high propensity to screw things up. I feel like that's just a good definition of skin. That we as, as, as humanity, we've got this high propensity just to screw things up over and over and over again. This, the scriptures from the Old Testament all into the New, it's humanity taking God's good gift and just screwing it up and God forgiving and redeeming and restoring, giving another good gift. Humanity screws it up. Right? I see that in you know, my own life and our own corporate life as well. Like from the very beginning, right, the good gifts that God has given, we've got this just propensity to screw it up, to mess it up. I mean, the scripture that I read for us this morning from Genesis takes us to the beginning. And it starts out right, that the Lord God took man and put him in the garden to till it and keep it. I actually think that's an important verse, that the role of humanity at the beginning was to care for creation. Right, that was our, our mission. Sometimes we look at, we act like it's opposite, but in the beginning, right, that was our mission, was to, to till and keep the garden, to care for this good gift that God has given. Right? There is beauty, there is freedom to live in this paradise, in this perfection as God had laid out. There's just one rule. <laughs> there was just, just one rule of not to do. And even with just one, <laughs> we as humans couldn't do it. It wasn't enough for us. So it continues. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. That at the very beginning, with the good gift of paradise, of the Garden of Eden that that we were given, we as humans, the one rule, Right, we screwed that up. And we could do a multitude of sermons on just the idea of shame, like that as soon as they did it, their eyes were opened and they felt shame. Anybody ever also feel that? We could do a sermon series on that. Yet what jumped out at me this past week was this sense of desire. Right, that when Eve saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to the eyes, and that it would make her wise like God, it was desirable. Right? She desired it. I was reminded that the devil's got this way of, of inviting curiosity, right? of making what is bad for us look good. So good that it's actually desirable. And what the serpent was offering Eve, it wasn't like a descent. I mean, so often if, if we knew that the decisions we made were going to take us down low, we'd be able to fight off those temptations. 
But so often, the way that we're tempted is it's an ascent. It's like, you're going to be like God. Right? If we knew that given our sin or a decision we make, right, relationships would fall apart, we'd be, it'd be easier to fight off the temptation. But the serpent almost always comes and offers an ascent. And asking that little question, sparking that curiosity of, of what if there was more? What if there was more? What you have isn't enough. What if there was more for you? And it's a basic temptation that I think we see clearly with kids. Or put yourself back when you were a kid and your parents had, you know, rules for you. Or we set up boundaries, or our parents set up boundaries for us because they love us. Or we set up boundaries for our kids because we love them. We don't give them curfew or a bedtime because we want them to be boring or live a boring life. Or we give them curfew and bedtime because we want them to be healthy. We, have the good, we give them screen time because we want them to be like functioning human beings. So we put boundaries on that. Right, we put boundaries on, on what can be eaten and when, not because we hate our kids, because we want them to live healthy lives. We put up sometimes physical boundaries. If you've got little ones, you've got to put up the dog gates for them. So they don't go walking just right off the stairs. We set up boundaries because we want to protect our kids. Right, we want to keep our kids, not because you know, we want harm for them, and at some point, whether you're a kid or you remember living in your parents' house, I mean, how many, when you saw those boundaries, at some point in your life you thought, mom and dad don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> like, I know better for my life. Like, mom and dad got no idea. I'm going to do what I need to do because I know what's better for my life. Right? We've all done that. All been there. It's the same thing we do with God, isn't it? Right? God's offered boundaries, not because God dislikes us, wants us to live a boring life. God's offer this, this life of beauty, right? A life based on fidelity, on truth-telling, on mercy, on forgiveness, on gentleness, on peacekeeping, and, and on down the line. God says, I've offered you eternal life. In fact, it's the life that is really life. It's the best way of living a life. It's the way to live a joy-filled life. And we see that, and we're like, ah, looks good on paper, <laughs> But I know better, so I'm going to do what I want to do, right? That same temptation, you're like, well, what if there was more? And what if there is more? And I read this past week that, you know, for the majority of church history, so you just think about church history, for the majority of it, the primary reason, we forget this, but the primary reason folks came to church for a long time was to be absolved of sin, for a long stretch of time, that's why you came to church, is so that the priest could absolve you of your sin. So for a long time in church history, there was just this uber awareness of sin. Because you're like, I've got to get to church, because that's how I'm going to get forgiven. Right? But with the Protestant Reformation, priesthood of all believers, and, and on down the line, right, we don't emphasize it as much. Because we believe we can go straight to the Father. We can go straight to, to get that sin. But if we never talk about it, if we never recognize it, if we never confess it, right, then why need a Savior? I mean, this past Wednesday, again, we devoted the service to talking about this idea that, that we're all sinners, that we're all at one day going to die. Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And as morbid as that might sound, there's some freedom in that. There's some relief in that. I mean, one of my favorite quotes that I mentioned Wednesday is that, that even on Ash Wednesday, even the doctors are relieved that they aren't in charge, <laughs> that they're just another person with some dirt on their forehead, right? That, that there's a relief that the world doesn't depend upon us, yet it depends on God. And, and in confession, it's the same way. There's a relief. There's a sense of freedom. And we don't have to pretend as though we've got it all together because nobody's got it all together, Every single one of us falls short when we prayed that prayer of confession. God, we've not loved you with our whole heart. We failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We've broken your law. We've rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We haven't heard the cry of the needy. That's a prayer I could pray every single day, and it would be true about me. Every single day, right, I fall short in some way, shape, or form of God's will for my life. And that last line we pray where we say, free us. Free us for joyful obedience. 
Right? We pray, free us from this. Free us, God. Not so that we can go do whatever we want, but free us to be obedient. Not only obedient, not begrudgingly obedient, but free us so that we might even be joyfully obedient to your will for our life. And this season that is Lent, it's a season that the church sets apart right, to take a look at our lives. Right, we think of it sometimes as a spring cleaning for the soul. Are there areas of your life that you're just consistently falling short? Maybe there's some obvious ones. Language, gluttony, greed, lust. Right? Yet it's also a sin to act as though the whole world depends upon you. Right? Atlas. Got to carry this world on my shoulders. The reason it's hard for so many of us to, to follow that commandment to Sabbath, to stop, is that I can't stop. It all depends upon me. That too is sin. I remember having a, having a conversation with my a youth pastor in high school, and it was that same realization I mentioned earlier where I was sitting with him, and I was like, Pastor, I'm doing pretty good. Like, I'm not doing any of this stuff. Like, I'm not doing any of this bad stuff. And he's like, have you thought about it? Yeah, think about, I'm thinking about it right now, <laughs> in fact. Right? He reminded me, too, that there's not only sins of commission, but there are sins of omission. Right? That when you don't love your neighbor as yourself, when you hear God saying, you need to go over there, you need to do that, you need to sit by that person. When you don't do that, <laughs> that, too, is sin. It's like, never mind. <laughs> like, we got some things to work on, Pastor. So are there areas of your life right, where you've ignored the voice of God, ignored the will of God in your life? If so, Lent is an opportunity to consider those, to examine those. Right, that spring cleaning for the soul, it's 40 days. Right, 40 days to cleanse the system. 40 days reminiscent throughout the scriptures that that 40 was important. Right, 40 days where Moses going up to the mountain without food. Elijah goes 40 days going to the mountain of God. Israel struggles for 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. This sense of 40, right, 40 days to, to cleanse the system, to examine our lives and see how we might grow closer with God's will for our life. And when I was growing up, the only thing I remember about Lent was that my parents would be like, you got to give something up for Lent. And I was like, no. <laughs> like, I'm not giving something up for Lent. Like, it's got to be something you like. Like, how about candy or chocolate or TV? Or the, and I was like, we're not giving anything up on my end for Lent until you make a good case for why. Like, why? All I can remember is that you're supposed to do it, but nobody, for a long time, they didn't tell me why. Like, why are we giving something up for Lent? And someone... The best reason, at least for me, was somebody said, you give something up for Lent because it helps educate your desires. It helps you learn to desire what God desires for your life rather than what the world might desire for your life. So it's not just for the sake of, of doing it. It's so that we can learn to desire the things that God desires for our life. In the same way that, you know, they explained it, the same way that an athlete or a musician goes through rigorous training or discipline, right? So that at the very right moment, at the right time, they can do the right thing. Whether it's a play on a basketball court, make the right pass, at the right moment, at the right time, you know, practice, 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 discipline, 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 to, to do that at the right moment when you're called upon. Same thing with the musician, right? Hit the right note at the right moment in time. Practice, 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 discipline. In the same way, right? We fast so that we learn to hear the call of God louder than the call of the refrigerator. Right? Maybe you fast from some level of media so that you learn to hear the voice of God in your life more loudly and more clearly than other voices in your life. It's a way to educate our desires, to, to learn to desire what God desires for our life. Right? To become joyfully obedient and I love that line because I don't want to just be begrudgingly obedient. Sometimes I am begrudgingly obedient. This idea that, that you can actually be joyfully obedient. That could, you could actually learn to desire what God desires. I remember at one point in time, I was like, this Christian life is going to be terrible if it's just an uphill battle the whole time. Like me trying to do the things that, that I never want to do. That's to, but I do believe through this process that the Methodists use this word sanctification of, of becoming made more and more like God. 
It's the process of giving yourself to God in worship and in the spiritual disciplines that you can actually become made more like God, that you can actually learn to desire the things that God desires for your life. Like on a small level, right, for one period in time, I was like, they're, they're telling me that putting all this cream and sugar in my coffee is not good for me. So I was like, you know what? Over time and through discipline, you know what I actually desire? I actually desire black coffee. <laughs> Learn to actually desire it. Like it has not worked with kale or some of the green stuff. <laughs> but maybe, God willing, one day we could get there. But in the same way, right, I think we can learn to desire what's good for us, desire what, what God wants for our lives. Because Lent, at the end of the day, it's about transformation, right? That we take time in the season of Lent to allow God to transform us. And maybe that starts with denying yourself in some way. Maybe that looks like right, abstaining from, from some food or from some form of media for for something, and that's a way that you can grow closer to God over the Lenten season. Maybe it looks like picking something up. For some folks, it might be starting something, a mission project, some act of service, a devotional. I mean, take time this morning on this first Sunday of Lent to just consider right, how God wants to transform you for this next 40 days, for this Lenten season. You know, what might God want to do with your life over Lent. So if you've already chosen a discipline, take time to pray this morning about how God might use that discipline to shape you. If you haven't, there's still time. There's still time to, to pray and to consider and to listen for the voice of God of, of what God might want to do in your life this Lenten season. And I love that we, we start Lent this Sunday around the table. Because right, the table is a reminder. It's also an altar. Sometimes we call it communion. We've got a lot of words for it. But it's also an altar where we remember that there's forgiveness. Right? That, that God offers his, his very life for us around that table. And I was leading a, with, with an Emmaus group this past weekend. And uh, I ended up reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke's versions of The Last Supper. And as I was reading those, those versions of The Last Supper, I was reminded that around the table, Jesus was sitting with like his best friends, right? The people that he journeyed through life with. They saw him teach. They saw him heal. Some of them, even around that table, said, said who he was. They got it. They're like, you are the Messiah. You are the very Son of God. Some of them saw him even transfigured. And they were all around that table that night, on the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us. And I was reminded that some of them, like the beloved disciple, stayed close with Jesus. But you know who else was at that table? Peter was at that table. And Jesus said, Peter, one, you're getting ready to fall asleep in just a moment when I need you most. <laughs> and just after that, I'm going to be denied three times. You're going to tell people that you don't even know me. Yet Peter was at that table. Judas. I had forgotten, but I, I was reminded that, that Judas was at that table. And Ju Jesus even calls out Judas and names it. But he keeps Judas at the table. He looks at Peter. He looks at Judas. He looks at his disciples, those who stay close to him, those that are going to betray him. And still he says, this is my body, which is broken and given for you. He still says, holds up the cup. This is my blood, the blood of the new covenant that was poured out for you. Still, even knowing what they were going to do, he still, offered, he still kept them at the table and offered his very life to them. So this morning, as we confess, as we've already confessed our sins, I mean, hear the good news that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love for us. So this morning, know deep in your bones that you are forgiven. And may we give glory to God. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for this Lenten season, Lord, an opportunity to pull back. Lord, hopefully an opportunity to slow down and to examine our lives, perhaps examine those areas that we fall short, examine our lives in such a way that, that we can hear your voice more clearly. God, we give you thanks that even though we screw it up, that you can't help but keep giving us good gift after good gift after good gift. 
God, as we're mindful of the ways in which we fall short, God, we claim your forgiveness this morning. God, we claim your mercy and we claim your grace and we pray that over the season of Lent that you would continue to transform us. Lord, starting today at this table as we taste of your grace, Lord, may we take that and go forth into your world to serve and to love you. For it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. And as we...